Well, we move from the sixth seal to the seventh seal in chapter 8. The breaking of each seal has brought some event or some symbol. We've got four horsemen representing the judgment calls to repentant, repentance. <clears throat> We've got the fifth seal, a call for perseverance, a promise of reward for the martyrs beneath the altar. And in the sixth seal, we witness a very sharp distinction between those who fear the presence of God and those who embrace Him by faith in the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Now, as we open up the eighth chapter of the book of Revelation, as Jesus, the Lamb, breaks the seventh and the final seal, three more, I would call them events, three more occurrences come into view. And uh, we see, first of all, silence falls, or there is silence in heaven. And then, second of all, we see seven angels receive their trumpets, which uh, is going to take a lot of our time over the next several weeks. And another angel with a golden censer comes to the altar of incense that is before the, before the throne. And so, I don't know about you, but I have questions when I read that. Uh, I have lots of different questions. As usual, I'm convinced that the answer lies not in speculating or in just trying to make sense of it, but is often uh, that speculation can be based on our own experience, our own conclusions, and sometimes just stuff that we've heard, our theological tradition, can get in the way uh, sometimes of understanding the book of Revelation. But the common knowledge of the church, the first church that received this letter, which was largely steeped in the Old Testament scriptures, forms, I'm convinced, the backbone for comprehending the book of Revelation. So uh, that will help to guide uh, I think, I hope, I pray, some of our responses to uh, the questions that this text comes up with. A little uh, note on chronology, because the chronology of the book uh, is, is a little bit, um, again, speculative in how we approach it. So uh, I think it is worth noting something about the relationship in time between the seven seals and the seven trumpets. In the sixth seal, we see what looks like the return of Christ. Revelation 6, verses 14 and 17, hide us from the unveiled wrath of the Lamb, right? And in the seventh trumpet, Revelation 11, 15, an angel will proclaim that the kingdom of Christ has come. And at the same time, we will notice again later on as we look uh, at the, um, the, the seven bowl judgments that uh, each one of those appears to come or comes to an end again with a declaration of the arrival of the kingdom. And so it looks like when we get to chapter 8, verse 1, it looks like the seven trumpets are, for lack of a better word, nested inside of the seventh seal. And the same thing is not clearly spelled out or not as clearly spelled out, but it looks that the seventh trumpet also causes the seven bowls to come out. So there looks to be a bit of a linear chronology, but then again, that linear chronology gets kind of thrown in the backyard because a lot of these events do seem to kind of circle back on each other and describe, but when you have uh, the return of Christ declared in the seals and then in the trumpets and then in the bowls, it looks like there is at some level a little bit of overlap. But I think you're also seeing a little bit more uh, like a spiral staircase. Uh, it's all going up in the same direction. It just looks like it overlaps as you go up. So I want you to just kind of think a little bit about the theme more than the chronology. I think that's the main lesson for us as we look at the book of Revelation. It's, it, it is not meant uh, to give us all of the answers that we crave. Uh, so it leads us to some questions. So do the trumpets follow the seals? Do they simply repeat the seals a different way with a different focus? I would suggest that they don't, uh, but that the appearance of the day of Christ's wrath at the sixth seal, the appearing of his kingdom at the seventh trumpet, do indicate some overlap, but maybe not a direct repetition. There is sufficient difference between all of the six seals and all of the seven trumpets to indicate that this is not a recasting of the same events from a different point of view. So I think that's important for us to look at. I think what we're looking at is an acceleration in both intensity and frequency. Uh, you know, and I had, I had one professor, and uh, he admitted that it was complete speculation, but he said, you know, it's like the six seals take up the first half to two-thirds of the book of Revelation, and then the trumpets kind of get rammed in real close to each other, and then the bowls happen almost, it seems, all at once. And, and that image has kind of stuck with me, and it makes sense of what we're looking at as we see what looks like an increasing cascade 
uh, if you will, across uh, the, the seals and the trumpets and the bowls of the book of Revelation. So we'll look at uh, a little bit more of that when we do get all the way back uh, to the, the seven bowls of God's judgment at the very end. Um, <clears throat> the point of Revelation, and if I can just kind of go backwards because it's not about the chronology, it's about the theme, it's about the, the story or the importance of the book of Revelation, is to be a blessing to the church. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this book. That's the whole point of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is meant to be a blessing to the church and her struggle to maintain faithfulness in a fallen world every day. And ultimately, as the church will in that day struggle to maintain faithfulness in a failing world in that day. The point of Revelation, like all prophecy, is not to seamlessly predict the future. We cannot approach the book of Revelation and say, well, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? Because what's going to happen next isn't the key idea. What's going to happen? And why is it going to happen? Those are the key ideas of the book of Revelation and any of the Old Testament prophets. If you look at Isaiah in one chapter, he'll be foretelling an event hundreds and hundreds of years into the future. And in the next verse, he'll be talking about an event that's next month. Uh, and in the next verse, he'll be talking about something that happened 200 years ago. And so if you read through any of the Old Testament prophets, they have the same pattern of not being dependent upon chronology, just trying to get the message across. And I think we can look at the same thing in the book of Revelation. So one more time, because I think it bears repeating, the point of Revelation is to be a blessing to the church in her struggle to maintain faithfulness in a fallen world every day. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me where you're at. Now, if you happen to be sitting on the couch and you don't feel like standing up, then that's fine. I'm going to let you get away with it. Uh, but at least set your cup of coffee down and open up your Bible. And um, unless you can open up your Bible without setting down your coffee. Okay, I get it. I get it. If you would read along with me, Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel came and stood at the altar, holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with the fire of the altar, and threw it to the earth, and there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. So you can be seated and you can pick up your coffee and your donuts once again. <clears throat> Let's start with silent anticipation because I think that's where the passage begins. We're just going to try and follow it through verse by verse. We start that passage with, in verse 1, silent anticipation. And the, the first event you have this silence that happens in heaven. The Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence. And, and, and I have questions. I, I wonder, and I wonder things like, well, what's the significance of the silence? Why is it for half an hour, or why is it about half an hour? What's so significant about 30 minutes of no activity in heaven? What about the location? It's in heaven, it's not on earth. What's significant about that? Those are the kind of questions we should ask as we come to the text and look at it, try to figure out what it is saying. I've often heard, and I've often thought, that it's like the... The calm before the storm, or it's like the, uh, the intake of, you know when a little child gets injured and they start breathing in for, it seems like, minutes before they finally let loose? <sighs> because they're letting loose a big one in just a minute, right? That's their plan is to, to let out a shriek, and, and I've always kind of understood that, and, and, and I want to think through that a, a little bit. I'm forced to consider the time frame. Why is the silence about half an hour? It's a weird it's, uh, the, the term uh, that we used in conversation at our house was, it's oddly specific. It's oddly specific. Because you just don't normally think of, in heaven, where we have this idea of eternity, where time doesn't seem to be really the issue, and why is it half an hour? It's, it's awfully oddly specific. And then it doesn't say half an hour, it says about half an hour. So that could be 20 minutes, 40 minutes, 32 minutes. Uh, so we're not talking about precision here. So that little conjunction about half an hour that destroys the speculation that we can calculate any kind of difference between what is so-called heavenly time and earthly time. One of the commentaries that I was exposed to uh, somehow managed to calculate that half an hour in heaven is precisely equivalent to 70 years of Roman history. Again, I, you know, I challenge it when, when somebody comes to the scriptures and their primary motive is to make things up. 
or I guess maybe not motive, their primary method is to make things up. Um, that, that's manufactured and honestly junk like that needs to be ignored. There's, there's, there's no comfort found in looking at the word. Oftentimes we can do a word study and we can try to say, well, maybe silence is used somewhere else to indicate something. No, it's only used one other time in the book and it, when uh, Paul gets arrested, uh, when he's in the Temple Mount and the crowd wants to tear him apart and the soldiers grab him and they start running up the stairs, Paul motions for the crowd to be silent and they get silent so he can talk. Well, that doesn't reveal much to us. It just tells us that silent means silent. Uh, that's all that, it, all that it informs us. So, you know, at that, that point in time, the crowd was being silent so that Paul could talk. And I wonder, I wonder as I think about that, if the silence here is not specifically located or given to us because something significant is about to happen, right? Remember, if you would, that the first century Christians that would read this, they got this scroll from John's pen and they were very familiar with the Old Testament and common Jewish practice. So why is all of that important? Um, there's a little book. Uh, it's well over 100 years old now, I think. It's written by Alfred Edersheim. Or Edersheim. I'm probably mispronouncing his name and all of my friends will email me and tell me so. Uh, the temple, its ministry and services as they were at the time of Jesus Christ. Care to guess what that particular book is about? It's about the stuff that was going on at the temple when Jesus was there. And so it tells us that at the beginning of Luke's gospel, for example, in Luke chapter 1, verse 8, when Zacharias is chosen by lot to burn incense in the holy place, he would have entered uh, and he would have been waiting for uh, somebody, an official in the temple precincts to give a symbol, uh, a signal rather. And while he was there, uh, that signal would be given that it was time for him to offer incense. And when that signal was given, all of the crowd that was gathered outside, as is recorded in the book of Luke, all of that crowd would have dropped to their knees or dropped to the ground, raised up their hands in silent prayer, and begun calling out on God. Because when this sacrifice of the incense was being offered, it was as if this, this fragrance was a co-sacrifice carrying their prayers or joining their prayers to heaven, making them pleasing to God. And so you have in the book of Luke, Zacharias is in the temple. He's a little too long. And the people are out there starting to wonder what's taking him so long. And so there's some idea that Edersheim puts forward, and I think it fits pretty well with the text, and it fits pretty well with the context, and that is that this half hour represents that time of intense prayer of the saints rising to God in heaven. And aren't we living in a time when intense prayer, I think, seems to be picking up? So I've got to ask the question, why is that important? We uh, take a look through the text, try to figure it out why is it important. Moreover, uh, you, you might say uh, that, that something else is happening. Well, let's, let's consider one more thing as we contemplate this silence as it relates to other seals. With the first four verses... A voice is crying out, come, to each of the four horsemen. On the fifth, the martyrs are crying out. And on the sixth, we get all these celestial signs and eruptions that uh, the people cry out, either in fear or in worship. But at the seventh seal, is silence. Well, what's the purpose of the silence? Based on what's, gonna what's going to happen, I would call it a silence of anticipation. And I want to draw a distinction between a silence of anticipation and a silence of fear. And I want to do that in two different reasons. Uh, number one, uh, because the location is in heaven where God's will is being done. Remember, we pray. Give us this day our daily bread. And right, our Father which art in heaven, there's the words. Uh, Hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Let your will be done. Where? On earth. How? The same way it's done in heaven. So God's will is already being done in heaven. So why is heaven drawing silent if it's not because there is an anticipation of God's holiness about to be displayed. Try to think about uh, a parallel to that. And it basically came down to when I was a child, storms for our family were something to be excited about. Our family, when the storms would begin rolling in, we would go out on the front porch and we would sit out there and we would watch them roll through. If they rolled towards the house, we'd sit there until the water drove us off. Uh, and sometimes we'd sit out there anyhow. It, it just something to do, and I enjoyed storms. And so today, when I hear thunder rolling, I am at peace. There is great anticipation for me when I hear the, the storms coming because I know that powerful things are going to happen and they're pretty to look at. Uh, not so uh, everybody. Everybody doesn't have that same reaction. Some people hear the first 
thunderstorm and they're like the puppy dog that goes and hides underneath the bed and the bedroom, right? Um, and so, uh, but I would say there's the difference between an anticipation of fear in the puppy dog and an anticipation of excitement, which is what I think is being pictured here with this silence in heaven. That was a, that was a long uh, roundabout way, but why is this important? Because the silence is an encouragement for you and I as Christians to, as Jesus says in Luke chapter 21, verse 28, lift up your heads because your deliverance is coming. We are meant to see this, brothers and sisters, as the mark that God's promises to judge wickedness and to deliver his people are about to come to pass. We're to view this the same way that the Israelites viewed the different plagues that were coming through and falling on Egypt. For every plague brought their deliverance closer. So we move on to the next verse and we see some angels getting some trumpets. And again, there's not an entire lot to go on there. The entire section of trumpet judgment begins from chapter 8, verse 2, and it goes through at minimum chapter 12, verse 12, where we read about the third woe beginning. But I think it goes actually much further, and we'll talk about the extent of these trumpet judgments uh, in the text as we go through it. But John's attention shifts to this component. He sees the seven angels who stand before God. Interestingly enough, I think it might actually be a technical description, although we know very little about it. We do know this, that when uh, Gabriel showed up to tell Zechariah that his wife was going to have a son, and Zechariah questioned Gabriel, Gabriel essentially said, how dare you? I stand before God. And it just so happens that in uh, Jewish uh, thought, uh, not in any of the biblical writings, but in Jewish thought, there were seven angels who were specifically tasked with standing before God to hear his commands and, fall, uh, and to, to pursue them. And, of course, Jewish tradition goes on to name them, and Gabriel happens to be among them named. Uh, just an interesting uh, uh, trail to trace, I suppose. But there's a background, a history there that uh, perhaps was uh, understood by the people who were hearing this the first time. Throughout history and in the scriptures themselves, trumpets are, well, they're used on the battlefield, they're used to summon the people, they're used to signal just about anything and everything because they were loud and they could be heard from long distances. Um, but most intriguingly, one of the festivals celebrated by the Jewish people is called the Feast of Trumpets. It shows up in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 23 through 25. In the fall... Uh, somewhere around late September on our calendar, on the first day of the seventh Jewish month, was a day of rest and a reminder by blowing trumpets. It was a holy assembly, an offering by fire is presented, and uh, it was a time of spiritual preparation for the Day of Atonement, which was coming really on the tenth day of the same month, and as well for the Feast of Booths on the fifteenth day of the same month. So this is a time of spiritual preparation. These are high and holy days in the land of Israel, and that fits in again with the theme of the trumpets might be wondering why God is using trumpets, and I think it's to tie in to that particular feast and to the particular intent of the people getting ready for that moment on the Day of Atonement when the sacrifice was made. Lift up your heads because your deliverance is coming. Once again, all of these are reminders for us to look heavenward. And then we move into the largest block, starting at verse 3. We've got another angel. The angel in the censer starts here. We're introduced at the last simply to him. He's just called another angel. We don't know anything else about him. Uh, <clears throat> but he's fulfilling the role of a priest, which is very unusual. He's fulfilling the role of a priest. He's holding a golden censer. It's a metal device. You would put some coals that were burning from the altar in it, and you would lay incense upon it, and then you could walk around and uh, spread the sweet scent of incense all over the place. The incense would rise before the veil in the holy place and cover the mercy seat. And in fact, we read in the book of Leviticus that the reason it was to do that, it was a thick cloud, was to conceal the mercy seat, or that is the Ark of the Covenant, from the priest so that the priest wouldn't die. Because that is where God was supposed to have his physical, visible residence. So here you have this angel and he's got a censer. And interestingly enough, the regular censers were brass. But again, in Jewish tradition, on the Day of Atonement, they would bring out the golden censer. And this censer happens to be made of gold. This ties the Feast of Trumpets and the Atonement together as we're looking at these moments where God's final deliverance is about to be given to his people. Not merely physical deliverance, but spiritual deliverance. And we read to the angel, a bunch of incense is given, much incense is given. 
Uh, and uh, in addition to shielding the priest, the incense was this pleasing scent, and it would rise as kind of a co-offering with the prayers, going and making them or joining them as a pleasing offering to God. And, of course, that's exactly what happens. The smoke of the incense rises, and uh, that's when the angel does something that is unscripted in the Old Testament. But he goes back to the altar of burnt offering, where the, remember where the souls of the martyrs are underneath, he goes back to the altar of burnt offering, takes more coals off of it, and then flings it down upon the earth. And then what happens? Very, very typical signs in the Bible of God's presence and power. Thunder, lightning, earthquake, just as much as there's an earthquake in the seventh, sixth seal. Um, all of those things are, are very common shows of God's power and presence in the Old Testament. So what's going on here? This is very cryptic. And to those of us that uh, uh, read this in the 21st century, it's, it's hard work to go back and to try and figure out what's the point of the imagery. A um, couple of things to note. Uh, number one, incense does not make our prayers go to God. I, maybe I should step sideways from the text for just a moment and, and point out that that's the Holy Spirit's task. The Holy Spirit, Romans chapter 8, intercedes for us with words that are too deep for, or groans that are too, too deep for understanding, uh, the Holy Spirit brings our prayers to the Father and translates them so that the Father hears our prayers, if you will. Uh, the angel fills this censer a second time, and he's filling it with fire from the altar. And the only altar up uh, in the temple uh, elements that would have had fire in it was not the uh, altar of incense. The altar of incense held incense that was to be laid on the fire, the only altar that held fire was the sacrificial altar, and that is holy. And it's used, for example, in Isaiah chapter 6. When Isaiah sees the image, or the, 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 the vision, the theophany of God that he sees, he looks up, he sees the temple robe, uh, the robes of God filling the temple, he hears the angels shouting, holy, 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 the thresholds are shaking, and Isaiah drops to his knees and he cries out, woe is me, I'm undone, because I'm a man of dirty speech, I live around people of dirty speech, basically, I'm toast. And the angel goes to the altar, takes a coal from the altar with tongs, and touches Isaiah's lips with it and says, see, your sin has been atoned for. He has been purified by the fire. And I want you to see this because I think this is inherent in every text in Revelation, and this is just another example where both salvation and judgment are going hand in hand. God's power to save and his power to judge are poured out on the earth. And with that, the seven angels take their place and they prepare to carry out God's judgments. But I want you to remember that all of these judgments have one purpose in mind. Take your Bibles and roll forwards to the book of Revelation, chapter 9. I want you to look at verses 20 and 21. Here is the result of so many of these truly dreadful plagues that we're about to see in the coming week or two. Revelation, chapter 9, verse 20 to 21, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of their works of their hands so as to not worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. The whole point of all of these judgments is to draw people to repentance. The worse it gets, the more the call to repentance is emphasized. It's like some of those brand new alarm clocks that you can go and get, or maybe the ones that are on your phone, that when they first begin to go off, they're very, very quiet. But if you lay there and you don't get up and turn them off, it gets louder and louder and louder. And I've got one of those, and I can now hear it click. And I usually get up and shut it off before it wakes up my wife. Um, but that's the goal. As the judgments of God get, if you will, fiercer and fiercer and fiercer, it's another call, followed by another call, followed by another call for the people of earth to wake up and to turn away from their sin. Christians, these seals and signs and trumpets are here to encourage you to stay steadfast in the midst of trial. And they're here to call the unrepentant to repentance if only they will humble themselves before God. 
So as we look at application, we can conclude with this. As the prayers of the saints rise to the throne, let's cry out to God for justice. We're invited to be a part of building up these prayers. Call out to God for the restoration of things as He desires them to be, not as we desire them to be. I have a very set list of things that I myself would love to see. That's not necessarily uh, God's design. So, Lord, let your will be done on earth as it's already done in heaven. Let's cry out for the protection of the persecuted. Let's cry out for the provision for the poor. Let's put our trust in Him who will judge and not forget that we also are called in holy sanctification to repent and live in repentance before the Lord. If you hear this and you know him as Savior, the seventh seal is encouraging and filled with an anticipation of God's final deliverance coming. But if you don't know him as Savior, the seventh seal is both terrifying as the judgment increases, and it is filled with grace as God once again gives an opportunity while you live to come to him. So if you hear this, come. Surrender yourself to the Savior. Receive the cleansing from sin that he offers because his grace is sufficient for you. Amen.